on you. Again, we'd like to say happy birthday to all those celebrating during the month of June. Welcome to Good Hope. If you are visiting Good Hope, we would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our service. We are so happy you are here. Let us give God glory and honor for the opportunity that he has given us to be here today to share his word and Christian love. Again, you are welcome. Thank you. Please continue to pray for our sick and shut-in and any bereaved families that we may have. This concludes the announcement. Amen. Well, let the church say amen. 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 Again, I do want to reiterate, uh, Sister Penny Ham, welcome to all of you, yeah, those of you who may be worshiping with us today, visiting. And we want to say a very special welcome to our special guest today, that is Linnell Pickett Jr. and his wife, Joe Penny. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel in the United States Army, served in Okinawa, in Japan, and the Nell is such a joy and delight to have you and your co with us, and we're so excited about it. So taking, it's been beaming all week long. The golden amen uh, from Orlando this this morning. Ren looked at me this morning and said, "That's your twin." <laughs> He even has a haircut. The difference, the difference is, Linnell can grow a full head of hair. <laughs> I can <laughs> So again, welcome to all our guests. Welcome, son. It is so good uh, to have you in Yoko with us today. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. Good morning. The psalmist said, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you people. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. And know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. God, our Heavenly Father, we come yeah. proclaiming that, yes, we are indeed your people. Yes. And we are so glad and privileged and honored to be able to say that you are our father yes. and we are your family. So, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will feel welcome in this place over the next hour or so. Lord, that he will not only feel welcome in this place, but, Lord, that he will feel welcome in our hearts and our lives. Search us, O oh God. Teach us today. And, Lord, bless us, because we have come to lift up the name of Jesus as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And it's in his name that we pray. And God's people together said, Amen. 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 Amen.
time for our scripture reading, and we're going to be, I'll be reading for you. If you have your Bibles, please return to Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 6, and we're also going to read verse 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah chapter 8. And I'm going to begin reading with verse 1. Nehemiah chapter 8. Now all the people gathered together as one man in the open square that was in front of the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could hear with understanding on that first day of the seventh month. And then he read from it in the open square that was in front of the water gate from morning until midday before the men and women and those who could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. So Ezra the scribe stood on a platform of wood which they had made for this purpose and beside him at his right hand stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maaseiah, and at his left hand stood Padiah, Mishael, Malchiah, Hashum, Hashbadanana, Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. Then all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands, and they bowed their heads and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Verse 8, So they read distinctly from the book in the law of God, and they gave the sense and helped them to understand the reading. May God add his blessing to the hearing and reading of his holy scripture. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him all the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and
There's some never lost the battle testimonies in this church. Did y'all hear me? There's some never lost the battle testimonies. The devil thought he had you. There's a never lost. Just looking out at the tears in the church, there's a never lost the battle testimony in this church. Because he can do all things. One thing he could never, ever do, y'all, and that's faith. Father God, in the name of Jesus. We come before your throne of grace this morning. Thanking you, Father, for the battles that you have gone before us, Father, and fought and brought us to and through. So we just praise you this morning. If we don't say nothing else, and if you don't do another thing, Father, you've already done enough. So we just say thank you for the battles that have already been won. We know there are more battles to come. We just want to be appreciative of the battles that you've already fought and been won. So we say thank you. The battles of addiction. The battles of homelessness. Father, the, the battles, Father, we're talking the battles of sickness. <laughs> to the point, Father, where the doctors have said they've done all that they can do. And when we called on the name of Jesus, Father, you showed up and you showed out. You won the battle over death. Jesus did it 2,000 years ago. Took the sting out of death. So we say thank you right now. Father, we're praising you. It's been a battle this week, Father. There have been sickness and heartaches. There have been letdowns and heartbreaks. But Father, as we sit here today, we praise you because the battle has been won. And we praise you this morning. Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for our 545 a.m. prayer group. Father, we've been praying all week, starting from Monday through Friday. And then on intercessory prayer from 6 to 6.30. Lifting those names up to you. Look what you did, Father. You showed up and you showed out. Father, you removed pressure from some eyes of some of the members. Father, you healed some from their sick bed. You delivered others who were traveling, Father. Father, you made a way out of nowhere. Father, you dried tears for those who were crying, for those who are lost. Father, you, you just showed up and you showed up. You stay true to your word that you never leave us nor forsake us. You stay true to your word that you are right there with us in our dark places and tight spaces, Father. You are our light in the middle of our darkness, Father. As we continue to struggle, we know, Father, that you never lost a battle and that you're right there in the midst of it. So we praise you this morning. Father, I pray right now for everyone listening to my voice right now, Father, for whatever they're in need of. For those, Father, those unspoken prayers. We know those, those prayers that are, are, are just, they feel too bad to say out loud, Father, but you know, Father. The blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus wipes away all of the dirt. All of the same. Oh, Father, we just thank you right now. We give you glory, Father. And we just say, have your will and have your way in this worship service. Father, we thank you for the nail to you and his wife, don't go, Father, traveling all the way across the waters from Japan, Father. We praise you this morning, Father. Oh, we know it was the skillfulness of the pilots, but they can't keep the airplane in the air, Father. There was nobody but you. I don't care how skilled they are and how many years they've been flying. You air, you aerodynamic and kept it up, Father. Across those waters, you landed them here safely. And we say hallelujah. So, Father, we praise you this morning. Just want to thank you, Father. Felt pretty low this week, Father. 
fell sick and uh, just did not feel well, but Father, you brought me through, Father. And I just praise you right now, Father. I just praise you right now, Lord. I thank you for my wife who was right there by my side, Lord. I thank you for her being there, not concerned if it was contagious or not. She stayed right there in the thick of it, Father. You kept her protected. Father, I pray for all those who are dealing with illnesses right now. I just plead the blood of Jesus over them. Nobody but you, Lord. We just thank you right now. You are a healer, Father. Father, there are some hurting hearts in here this morning, Lord. There's some hurting hearts, Father. We just pray that you would just give them that peace that Paul speaks about. That peace that surpasses all understanding, Lord. Comfort them and be with them, Father. For those who are lost, loved ones, for those who are struggling with health issues, for all that you've done, all that they're doing, Lord, we just thank you right now, Father, for your peace. Father, we thank you for reaching out and touching our members who were in need this week. That was nobody but you, Lord. Yes. Father, you are a way maker. Yes. Oh, yes. My yes. wife said you're a miracle worker. All right. yes. And then on top of that, Father, she said you're a promise keeper. Yes. We praise you this morning. Yes. Father, now as we get ready to hear the word, I just want to thank you for the man of God who's going to bring the bread, of, the word of God to the people of God. As he break the bread of life, Father, Continue no anointing on his life. We thank you for he and his wife. We thank you, Lord, as they, uh, and we thank you for bringing them back, Father. They traveled to South Carolina, Lord, 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 did what they needed to do. You brought them back here. And on top of that, you brought them back with a word. So, Father, we just turn this service over to you. Continue to bless and have your will and have your way. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Church, say amen. 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 Thank you so much, Reverend Pastor Stephen, for leading the prayer, pastoral prayer today, Pastor Harris reading the scripture. Thank you so much to the small and quiet amen. song. Amen. 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 The military alien command in the Air Force that used to say their slogan was on time. All right, all right. Brother Jay Rose and Jimmy Small is taking care of the sound this morning. Our production is this message goes all around the world, globally and globally. We thank you so, so very much. Amen. And Sister Tarsha Cunningham, we got those announcements up there today. You're doing a beautiful job. That's creativity, y'all. We appreciate it so much. God, we thank you so much for another opportunity to worship you. Father, we pray today that our worship will be in spirit and in truth. All we do and say is bring your name, glory, honor, and praise. Now, Father, we pray that you will speak to us, for we, your people, need to hear a word today. Now we're turning our attention to heaven, waiting in great anticipation for you to proclaim unto us the great riches of your word. May you be glorified, your people blessed, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord remains forever, so says Isaiah 48. On last week, I began a three-part series entitled Habits of Highly Effective Christians. And so in this series, I'm going to just give you three high habits of highly effective Christians. There are others, but these are three primary. So last week, uh, we dealt with prayer. We talked about prayer. Yes. Highly effective habits. Highly effective Christians. If you're going to be a high octane Christian, if you're going to be a Christian of that impact, cultural <coughs> impact, a Christian that's going to make a difference, you're going to have to pray. Yeah. You have to pray throughout Scripture. It talks about prayer. Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Jesus went away uh, and he prayed. Yeah. 
And yeah. so when you find highly effective Christians, you must have a powerful, powerful prayer life. A habit is something that you do over and over again. So today I'm just going to deal with one habit, and that is the habit of reading your Bible. Right. You're going to be a highly effective Christian. You're going to make an impact for the kingdom of God. Uh, if you're going to be more than just mundane, uh, uh, if you're going to uh, uh, effectively uh, bring about change and promote the kingdom of God for his glory and honor, you're going to have to be a student of the book. You're going to have to stay in the book. Pastor Harris read beautiful, and I commend you for those names. Yeah. Yeah. We all know Pastor Harris can read. Just that verse 8 in the text. Uh, so they read distinctly from the book. They read distinctly from the book. They read distinctly from the book. In the law of God. And they gave the sense. They gave the understanding. And they helped the people to understand the reading. They gave the meaning and they kept the people to understand the reading. High habits of highly effective Christians. Those of you who are in the habit of reading your Bible regularly, but I mean daily, will find yourselves functioning as highly effective followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you read your Bible on a regular basis, you're going to find yourself functioning at a highly effective level. And let me hasten to say here, reading the Bible means more than just intellectually reading to gain wisdom and knowledge and understanding and even discernment. Reading the Bible also means applying the wisdom the knowledge, the understanding, and the discernment that you get. That, that reading is an expansive definition. It means not only are you consuming knowledge, but you are living out, you are acting out, you are putting the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding, and the discernment that you get from the Bible. You are putting it in practice every day. You're not just reading it and then putting it back on the shelf or putting it back on the table. You're not just reading because of the, a requirement to read, but, you, you're not just, but you're reading so that you can gain the wisdom, the knowledge, the understanding from the Word of God, and then in turn, you're going to put into practice what you have read. That makes the difference. That's the reason why when we read the Word of God, it changes the culture. It changes the climate uh, 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 of where we are, and it changes who we are. When we read this word, it, it changes things. Right, right, right. Yeah. Now, I, I tell you, I've uh, heard many, many pastors, and I've been in meetings myself. They've just been outrageous. You, you know, if you didn't know you had a church, you, you, I mean, you had a meeting, I and mean, if you didn't know, you were like, what in the world is going on? But I assure you, and I share this with my friends who are pastors, even going into a church, for the first time you come come again, the first thing you need to do is get them to read through the Bible Amen. together. Amen. Because those who read it to the Bible, when they come to a meeting, it's a whole different atmosphere. Because they're bringing the knowledge of the Word of God, and they're putting the Word of God into practice in the meeting. Right, so they right, know right. how to deal with each They know how to approach issues, complex issues, hard issues. Issue, not from a worldly framework, but from the Word of God. The whole atmosphere of the church changes when people are reading the Bible. That's right. Yeah, right. Yeah. Yeah, I can walk into the church, I can in a congregation, I can be here just a little while, and I can tell if the people are Bible reading. Right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. It changes the culture, it changes the climate. Dr. Charles Stanley, who's now in heaven, wisely said, approach scripture with an honest attitude. 
And then he says, and then he says, when you come to the scripture, this is what you need to do. Meditate on the scripture. Yeah, yeah. Read it as you think about it. Meditate it. Think about it. I love that uh, about, about Mary. I mean, when the angel spoke to her, she pondered the things in her heart. She thought about it. She meditated on it. Right. Meditate. Right. Dr. Stanley right. says, when you come to this word, meditate on the scripture. And then he said this, expect God to speak to you. When you pick up your Bibles and begin to read, you expect God to speak to you. God, I'm here in your presence. I'm reading your word. I'm not going through an exercise of futility. I am expecting you to speak to me. How many of you know that when you read the word of God, God is speaking directly to you? How many of you have gone into your reading time and read a passage that helped you throughout the day. It spoke directly to your need. Oh, Dr. Stanley yeah. says, yeah. expect God to speak to you. And then he says this. This is key. He says, then apply what you read. Right. Right. Apply yeah. what you study. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. How many of you, when you visit a doctor, a specialist, or whatever, sure. you know they study. They got, the, they got the degrees hanging on the wall. Yeah. Many of them. But what you want them to do in your process is that you want them to apply yeah. all of this good information That's that they've right. gotten from medical school and from seminar and study. You want them to apply that right. to you. Yeah. You fly. I mean, he don't make no, I mean, the pilot might, he may be in school, he or she in school, but when they're in the air, I want them to be applying right. what they have learned. So that we can get to where we going by the grace of God. A. W. Tozer, great theologian, wrote, "Nothing less than a whole Bible can make a whole Christian." In quote. Nothing less than a whole Bible can make a whole Christian. In other words, Tozer saying, "Don't piecemeal it together." Read the full counsel of God. Read it from cover to cover. Then you can see the big picture. That's what told him, see. Abraham Lincoln, former president Abraham Lincoln said, the Bible is the best book God has given to man. The Bible is the best book. A lot of books. A lot of libraries. You can download books. We read books even on our, on our, on our, uh, devices now. But the best book you would ever read will be the Bible, the Word of Amen. God. And you will never let it you. I read the Bible now for, for years. And, and even as I go through the one year Bible, even now, even today, I will see something illuminated that I have missed before. I've been reading through the Bible, and yet every year, every time I say, Wow, God is illuminating something. How in the world did I miss this before? Yeah. You're never exhausted. You're never exhausted. And that won't ever be a book. You can read and say, okay, I'm done with that. It's on the shelf. I don't want to bother with that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> in reference to the Bible, John Wesley, the hymn writer, the pastor, the preacher, wrote, at any price, give me the book of God and let me be a man of the book. Now, Stephen B. preached at this conference, you know, are you man enough? Right? What's up, Pastor Stephen? You man enough to be Christ-like. To be Christ-like, see? Yeah, that's what he's saying. Give me the book. Let me be a man of the book. Let me be a person of the book. Martin Luther, the 15th century former Catholic priest in Germany, known as the church reformer, declared, and I quote, my conscience is captive to the word of God. Help me somebody. Yeah. How much better off will we be when our conscience right. is captive to the word of God? Right now, Moody, the, the founder of the historical Moody Church in Chicago, they named Moody Bible Institute after him made a profound statement concerning the Bible. He said the Bible will keep you from sin mm. or sin yes. will keep you from the Bible. Mm. 
I think Ruby said something right there. Yes, How many of us, as we read through that Bible, is keeping us from sin? I want to really give him a piece of my mind. I really want to tell her off, and I really hope that she would say something. <laughs> But I read in my body where I am supposed to love my enemy. Where I am supposed to go with vengeance in mind, says the Lord, I will repay. Yeah, this Bible, this Bible, this Bible will keep you from sin. When you read it, you learn of the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And you understand that you are not your own, that the Holy Spirit is controlling you, controlling your tongue, your behavior. It'll keep, I'm telling you, read this Bible. It'll keep you from sin. It'll keep you out of a lot of trouble. Keep you from heartbreak and embarrassment. Then, who he says, a sin will keep you from the Bible. What is it that's keeping people from reading the Bible, spending time in the Word of God? What is it? Lastly, F. B. Myers counsel: We should read the Bible as those who listen to the very speech of God. Mind is saying, when you read the Bible, you are listening to God making a speech to you. You open that book, God speaking. He's pouring into your life his internal, his eternal truth, his character. In January 2020, in our Vision 2020 meeting, much of our good hope church family began reading through the one-year Bible and meeting small groups. Many of y'all bought into the vision in that meeting. Not for saying that for us, everybody. I just said, this is the vision God has given me for the church for us to begin reading through our one-year Bibles together. Now the enemy whispered in my ear, they ain't going to do that. <laughs> That's going to be pushback from doing that. But I said, no, 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 this is from God. So began reading through our Bibles, and people began meeting in small groups, and uh, group leaders came up and, and volunteered their, their, their services. Now, the joy and satisfaction that we ex have experienced is beyond words as we swiftly move towards completing our fourth year of systematic Bible study and meeting in group. And this is all we say that the joy and the satisfaction, what reading to the Bible has done for me is more than I can verbally express. Yeah. I've heard so many wonderful testimonies. Yeah. How reading through the Bible has brought couples to each other. Yeah. Reading through the Bible has helped people have purpose and meaning in life. People reading through the Bible say, I did not know that before. I'm growing. I have so much joy. So why do we place great emphasis on reading the Bible and hearing Good Hope reading through the one-year Bible every year? Three reasons. First, reading through the Bible, particularly with us now reading through the one-year Bible, gives you a simple plan of reading a portion of Scripture every day. Simple plan. You're going to read the Old Testament, New Testament, Psalms, right. Proverbs every day, 365 days a year. Yes, now, as I shared with you when we began this journey, I remember just in Bible study, even from this, this in, in this pulpit, I said to you, you can complete your reading, daily reading assignment in the one-year Bible in less time than it will take you to read. A third, and listen to a 30 minute or watch a 30 minute movie clip. Isn't that amazing? That in less than 30 minutes, read it through your body. You can read it in less than just how that it take you to watch a 30 minute program. And I say that 
in Bible study. That freaks some conscience. Some people had not thought about that. All right. Here's my humble confession. I like to do this every once in a while. I like to <laughs> confess. All right. I know y'all already know that pastor ain't perfect. Make a lot of you know he's made mistakes. So here's here's my confession. All right. My humble confession. There were days in my life when I would walk with easily watch three to five hours of television. The one day, three to five hours of television, including the local and international news. I could do that three to five. Matter of fact, some 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 mornings I would get up, and before I heard the good news from the Word of God, I got the Good Morning America news. I got the news from the radio and every place else. All right, can I go deeper, brother? Go ahead. And some sisters, too, because I know some sisters just as guilty as I was. <laughs> some Monday nights, I would spend more than four hours in front of the tube watching Monday night football, including, the time included, okay, the pregame show, <laughs> the halftime show, and the Game show. Four hours. Can I say something to y'all? Shame on me. Shame on me. It's real, y'all. My Bible reading time, time in the Word of God, came nowhere near to my television watching time. I can only imagine these days the, the internet, the surfing of internet. I mean, people get up early in the morning, go to the internet, get all the news, catch up on all the Facebook channel, read what friends and foes have to say, <laughs> look at the clock, out the door to work or whatever the case may be, and never touch the word of God. Amen. If we touch it, it's late on. But I just suppose God said, well, wait a minute, you're going to face some stuff today. And, and I want to meet with you early in the morning and give you a word so you will know how to respond. If I miss that time with God in the morning, I might run into some stuff. And in my crowd with God, well, God would simply say to our heart, if you had come to me first, set your agenda. You have a better prepared. To handle what was coming your way. So I encourage you to take personal inventory of your own time. And this is a personal personal uh, a thing. Nobody can judge you or, or make you do. My friend, Pastor Blakely Scott, who's been pastoring in Columbia, South Carolina, he's been here to preach before, told me early on, he said, pick it. You can't force grown folk to do nothing. Right. <laughs> and we are not in the business of trying to force people or bully people or twist people's arms to do things. But we ought to be in the business of sharing truth with people and praying by God's Holy Spirit that they will make the right choices. That's right, man. Right. And then they don't do it, shame on them. But if, but, but if I don't share it, then shame on me. So I encourage you to take personal inventory. And I challenge you to invest time every day reading the word of God. Now, we love the one year. It works good for us. But if you got another method and you read it systematically through your Bible, read the word every day. Do not make excuses. Read it. It's for your own good. I encourage you to read it every day to, to saturate your mind. What 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 are many minds saturated with? I can tell you just by people's behavior. People saturate their minds with a lot of things. People who are rude clerks, they saturate their mind with the wrong stuff. People who are mean and angry and bitter, nursing meanness, anger and bitterness, they saturate their minds with the wrong things. People are always worried. 
They'll set you in your mind with all things. The Bible will tell us, Philippians 4, 19, that my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Philippians 4. Feel not I'm with you. Philippians 4. Isaiah 41 10, brother, feel not I'm with you. Be not dismayed, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Philippians 4. Be anxious for nothing but in everything. Pray. And then God will give you peace. That's the word, God, but if people don't read it, they don't know. I challenge you to fill your heart with biblical truth. Here at the Good Hope Church, we take Bible literacy seriously. I'm not interested in having program. I'm not interested with people lauding me with gifts on anniversary day. I'm not interested in that. What I'm interested in is our people Learn in the word of God that our biblical ministry rate goes higher and higher and higher. We want people to be students of the word, the book. I heard a pastor just at our pastor's conference last week, the minister's conference. I hadn't been in over about three years because I told him I'm not coming as long as this pandemic is going on. And I'm definitely not encouraging our church members to wear a mask and then I'm out here, you know, in y'all's midst. <laughs> so we lifted our restrictions and now we lift, then I can go back again. But one pastor stood up and he was talking about this, this Bible um, method for young, for young people. And he was saying, we got people in teaching Sunday school that do not know the Bible. That's, that's what he's saying. Well, how would you like to have an English teacher or an algebra teacher or a science teacher as you trying to prepare yourself or prepare, get your children prepared for school, for college, everything, you know, in the classroom before your children and they really don't have a clue. They haven't studied, they don't know. No, you want teachers who know the subject matter and who can convey that subject matter to your children. Yeah. Or to you if you're in higher level education. So here at the Middle Church, our leadership takes biblical literacy seriously. In fact, so seriously that in order to join our pastoral staff and to or become a ministry leader, uh, you must demonstrate a love for the word of God, a commitment to reading God's word and putting it into practice because Pastor Stephen, Pastor Harris, Pastor Wim want people when they stand here preaching. We want people Preachers who have read the Bible themselves. Second, reading through the one your Bible helps you avoid being misled. That's a good reason to read your Bible, y'all. It helps you avoid being misled. One of the reasons well many, many people fall victim to religious cults, fall victim to con artists, religious con artists, Tricksters and hustlers is because of a lack of biblical knowledge. People just don't know. Well, let me just give you several examples. You already know these. I'm going to reiterate them briefly. In 1978, cult leader Jim, Jim Jones led more than 900 residents, including more than 200, some estimates say 300 children to their death on his Jonestown religious plantation in Canada. Now, these people came out of well-established churches. A number of them in San Francisco came out of well-established African-American churches. They were a mixed race, a mixed breed, but here they were, all this and Jim Jones, not preached the gospel, but preached socialism. And preach to the people that he was the Jesus incarnate. And that he was their Messiah. So they either shot them, were shot, or drank cyanide, laced, uh, poison with punch. Jim Jones preached that he was their Messiah. Imagine that people sitting up in there. He telling them that he's the Messiah. And, and, and folks turning over their mortgages to them and the titles to their cars 
And all of that kind of stuff. This is real, y'all. Obviously, men is brought into Jones's warped opinion of himself. In April 1993, cult leader David Koresh, along with more than 80 members of his Divinity, uh, branch Divinity cult, including 25 children. Think about little children under the care of their parents, and yet they died in a fire at the cult compound in Waco, Texas. In his book, this is documented, author Jeff Gwynn describes Koresh as, quote, a religious demagogue who took multiple teenage brides. And if you read in your Bible, you understand one man, one wife. Amen. Help me somebody. And I ain't going to even go into that. One man. What, what? If, you, if you read the book, you will know. Yes, sir. Yes, so yes. how in the world are folks sitting up in this compound, yes, yes. this joke of marrying multiple teenage wives? Yes, yes. Then he preached that history yes, yes. his followers would bring about conflict that would make the end of days happy, happen in their lifetime. Well, now the Bible says no man knows the hour. No man. Except for God, and if you know that, then you're not going to be duped by folk with false prophecies talking about the Lord is coming back tomorrow. Well, he might come back in day, but you don't know it. But you read no Bible so you can be all so ready. So whenever he comes back, if you read your Bible, you understand that because you believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you good. I ain't rushing it. <laughs> I'm going my way to hell. In 1997, Marshall Applewhite led 39 members of his Heaven's Gate cult to commit suicide by drinking poison. Applewhite preached, and this is what he preached, that suicide would allow them to leave their bodies and enter an alien spacecraft. He is behind the hell pop coming and passed through heaven's gate into a higher existence. Well, the Bible tells me that for the believer to be absent from the Bible is to be present with the Lord. I don't need no spacecraft. <laughs> All I need is Jesus. I close my eyes here in death. I open them there in heaven. That's the Bible, but people don't know unless they read. Yeah. Yeah. Even if they hear somebody else say it, you need to read it and verify it for yourself. Am I right about it? Yeah. I like those uh, Bereans, don't you? Because by, by, by all them were preaching, they were tracking along and seeing what they were saying. Too. Now, just a couple of weeks ago, brother, my prayer partner Armstrong and his sister were seated though in the church up there. And so brother Armstrong said, Pastor, come here, come here, come here. He said, uh, who uh, was David's oldest son? <laughs> now, I mean, I, I've been preaching all these years. <laughs> and so I said, I said, Absalom. I felt pretty good. Then I said, I was talking about it. No, Absalom was not his oldest son. I said, uh, my sister Rose shaking her head. <laughs> All right, who was, who was David's oldest son? Evan. Evan was his oldest son. Then the second oldest son was Daniel. He was the daughter of Abigail. Ab he was the daughter of, 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 of son of Abigail. Abigail was the wife of a fool named Nain. Yes, sir. When he died. Check this out. When he died. He died. Abigail married David. You don't hear about Daniel. Because theologians believe that he died early in the process. Right? But you don't know unless you read. And listen, even those who 
are proclaiming the Bible from the sacred desk are subject to make a mistake. I mean, we're all human, right? And it ain't nothing about this desk and the title uh, makes us superhuman to the point where we don't make mistakes. Only Jesus was a perfect man. So every once in a while, I remind us of the picture. <laughs> that everybody, even me, <laughs> makes a mistake. And see, here's something else the Bible teaches, right? You Bible reads one. By what measure you measure, it shall be measured under you. So that means if I'm measuring out grace amongst a good whole family, when y'all mess up, I don't care what it is, whatever it is, you make mistakes, then when my time comes, that will be somebody. <laughs> I ain't seen the beast nailed to the ground. <laughs> oh, Pastor, the pastor makes a mistake. He already told you that. When you make him, he's going to be kind to you. He expects the same thing. But y'all, that's the book. Yeah. Right? And so, and so, one might ask then, how in the world could people in these instances be so colorful? Just here a few years ago, about 98, you know, there was a place up there, a church up there. I mean, folk just walking over there. Dad talking about he ran he punching people in the stomach and slapping grandma. I was talking about the grandma slapped and all that. The lady called me. I'm talking to the lady from South Carolina. Have you been? I know, because I'm passionate. I don't know what they're doing up there. But I can tell you this. Later on, they found out that he was a trickster. Involved with a woman secretary up there. His wife divorced him. And now when you drive by the church, that building that used to be a church, it ain't dead no more. The building there, but ain't something else. Y'all yeah. see what I'm trying to tell you? You got to read and study. Know for yourself. How is it that people can be so gullible, so misinformed, so misled? The answer is simple. When people refuse to read and study God's word, they become prime targets for religious con artists who ply their trade of theological hocus pocus and ecclesiastical nonsense. That's all it is. A lot of this stuff y'all watching on television and it ain't nothing but hocus pocus and nonsense. And if you read your Bible, you will understand that. I mean, they had folk come in here, well-known speaker, and you know, they opened the place up but they said that if you want preferred seating, it's going to cost you $100. <laughs> <laughs> and then another one came, if you you know, you can come, but if you want to take a picture with him, an autographed picture, it's going to cost you, you know, 50, 75. The higher up you go, you know, the more stuff you do, you get your picture signed, it's going to cost you a little bit more. Nonsense! You read your Bible, you find out that Jesus never charged a dime. His apostles never charged a dime for the preaching of the gospel. But if you don't know, you if you don't need work, you won't know. Oh, man, send me, you know, $100, I'd be your prayer club. <laughs> and then jokers out on yachts, you know, over in, the, over in the Caribbean, you know, chilling. Yeah, over in the chilling and eating upscale restaurants and stuff like that. And folk out there working hard every day. Jokers spending more on a drink than you making an out. That's all I'm trying to get you to do, get home. It's continue to read your Bible. Pastor Harris, Pastor Wynn, Pastor Steve. We want well-informed Christians. Amen. Because you're going to then be highly affected. And then here's the other thing. When I know y'all read the Bible, it don't make no difference if you go to Aunt Jane Church. They might be preaching heresy, but I know you sitting up there saying, no, that ain't right. All right. That in the Bible. I don't mind you visiting other places. They got all kind of stuff going on, hoopla, nonsense. Yeah. I know that you know better. Yeah. Now you're gonna feel some pressure when folk going on, you know, and, and folk telling you, uh, you know, you, you need to stand and you need to go. And I know sometimes the pressure, okay, well, everybody look at me, 
they jumping around, you know, and I ain't doing, I mean, I'm just sitting here. Yeah. And so I might as well go ahead and stay. Well, you know, you got to deal with that. But here's the reality. Those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. You can worship God, I'm trying to tell you, in spirit and in truth, sitting there meditating on God. Now, if the spirit and truth is moving you to shout and run, go ahead and do that. But don't feel like you got to impose that on everybody else. Because the Spirit might be telling them just to be quiet and meditate on me. But now if I'm trying to force you to run like I'm running, then I'm interrupting your worship. That's not biblical. Besides that, y'all stand up on your feet. You looking at me. You, you. No, I ain't here to worship you. If I'm standing on my feet, it ain't even about you. It's about God. You got to read it, y'all. You got to understand. It. You know, you read the word, you you prepare yourself to share. Well, on last evening, Sister Pickett and I were with our daughter, granddaughter, in my daughter, <coughs> there in South Carolina. And we had a famous restaurant. This is probably the most famous restaurant in, in uh, Charleston, South Carolina. I mean, you can look around this restaurant, you guys saw uh, Danny Glover picture up there. And, Oprah, I mean, there's a whole bunch of people, pictures up there. And I saw this young man, he was at another table, and he talking to the people, and then he, he came over to our table. And when I, I looked at him, I recognized who he was, because I seen the picture on the outside, you know, with, the, with his dad and his, his, his dad on the picture out there. And he was, he was the third generation owner. So he came over and introduced himself. I said, well, yeah, you, you know the name, I knew his name because name after the restaurant. He said, yeah, 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 you know, my granddad is, you know, founded this place, started this place, restaurant, and it was back in the 1800s, and blah, blah, blah. He said, how do you do it? I said, man, everything was good, you know, so big and building, and mighty, like, yeah. <laughs> 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 I mean, you know, all that stuff, I like, hey, I'm going to come back here. <laughs> <laughs> I was getting ready to go because I'm on the top. I don't wear your head in the building. Not unless you're a woman, not female. But don't wear your head, especially not in church. I'm like, I'm, so I put my head, I'm getting ready to go. And so I had 316, John 316 on my head. You know what this young man asked me? Young man. He said, What is that? He said, What is John 316? I'm like, I'm glad you asked, bro. I mean, that's the most, <laughs> best question you asked. And so I went on to share God. I quoted it first. And I told him that what this means. He said, what it means? I said, what it means is if you believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you go to heaven when you die. You spend eternity with God when you die. He looked at me and smiled. This is what he said. Quote, thank you for that. Now you got people walking around in 2023 all of this money Owner of an exclusive, well-known, famous restaurant, don't know Jesus. Don't know Jesus. So he said, thank you very much for telling me. The point is this, y'all. When you know the word, you know, when you when you know the word, when you practice the word, God uses the word to bring others to himself. Dr. Larry Thomas told me. Dr. Thomas told me, he said, told the class really in, in freshman orientation. He said, now listen, y'all at Benedict College to get prepared. He said, now when you at the train station, when the train is coming, that's not the time to run home and pack your bag. <laughs> he said, you need to have your bag packed and you need to be at the station. Here's what reading through the Bible does, y'all. It packs your bag spiritually. You're standing at the station. You're standing in the class. You're sitting in the restaurant. You're in the airport. You're in the store, the grocery store. And when the train comes, you are equipped to say, oh, yes, let me tell you about Jesus. Yeah. You got to be. Okay. Second Timothy 2.15, Apostle Paul hammers home this invaluable truth. He wrote, be diligent. New King James Version says, study. 
Be diligent to show, to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not be, need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That, y'all, is important. You got to know the word in order to share the word. There was a preacher some time ago, this was years ago, back when Fred was open, I was over there, the church one went down, before coming to church went down to eat, he was out there, he was having problems in the church he was at. And so he took about 20 minutes, y'all, berating his pastor. Tell him about all the mistakes his pastor made, why he don't like him, why he don't want to be there. And then this is what he said to me. He said, I was thinking about joining you all at Good Hope, where all kind of bells and whistles going on in my mind. And I immediately said to him, I said, you know what? You come to Good Hope, Bill, Bill and Pastor Jack, you're going to have books to read, you will have papers to write. You will have a sentence. Now, then we wouldn't even read through the one in your Bible at that time. But if I saw it again, it would be, and you will have to read your one year Bible, participate in a small group for a year, and we expect you to do it over and over and over again. But just with the little bit I told y'all, this is what he said to me. Oh, no, that, I don't want that. <laughs> but I know you don't. And we don't want you to eat. <laughs> Because we don't want you, our staff, Dr. Williams, Dr. Harris, Dr. Steve, we don't want you, you know, giving out false and bad information. We don't want you here trying to hoop people, shout people, and carry on with all kind of trickery. Because we're interested here in biblical lyrics. Well, reading through the Bible is extremely important. I want to just leave you with this. In today's scripture text, Nehemiah 1 through 6, Ezra, watch this, y'all. Just a few more minutes and I'm done. Ezra, the priest, brought the book of the law before the assembly of the men and the women. Brought the book. And then he, watch this, y'all, he read the book from morning to midday. Reading scripture. Can you imagine that? Reading scripture. From morning to midday. In verse 3 the text says. And the ears of all the people. Were attentive to the book of the law. Oh God. May you give us ears. That are attentive to your word. That's what we want. Right. Ears of people. Now even church people. Are attentive to so many other things. Instead of being attentive. To the word of God. Then in verse 5. He opened the book again. And all the people stood in honor, in reverence of the word of God. In verse 6, the people said, Amen, lifted their hands, and then they bowed down their faces to the ground, and they worshiped God. They were so excited about the word. Oh, God, would you give us an excitement about your word? Give us an unquenchable thirst and an insatiable appetite for your word. I got to have it. Y'all know that Brewster's, that uh, ice cream out there? Yeah. Yeah. What's the name of it? <laughs> Not Brewster, the other one out there at the Lakeside Village. Strong Cold. Cold Stones, so think she know that. Cold Stones. Cold Stones. Cold Stones. But out of Cold Stones, out of Cold Stones, they got these three cups. Mm. <laughs> they got Lackey. Uh -huh. That's a small cup. Yeah. <laughs> They got love it. That's a medium size. They got it. got to have it. Our prayer is when it comes to the word of God. Don't say that. Thanks, sir. This is the whole place. Let's say that again. When it comes to the word of God, we got to have it. Let's say that again. We got to have it. Come on, one more time. Let me know you mean it. We got to have it. Understand. Lord, we thank you for your word today. Because we don't want to be ordinary, mundane Christians. We want to be highly effective Christians. We want to be highly effective in our homes, in our jobs, in the workplace, in the community. 
God, we know that your word will give us supernatural power. You give us supernatural insight, supernatural power, so that we can be supernatural in a world that so desperately needs us to see you. Last week I saw a church sign that read as one of the best signs I've seen on the church. It says, Today, you be the reason that people say God is good. Can you show if you read this book dead, obituary, you will be the reason people say. If you're here today and you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, we'd like you to come just as you are. Listen, we read the Bible. We know that becoming a Christian is not about works. It's not about earning our way. It's not about doing good stuff. None of us deserve. None of us deserve. But we know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But God did not send his son, verse 17, into the world, condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's what it takes, y'all. If you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, Jesus Christ, he suffered, bled, and died, rose from the sick, and shed his blood to save you. Thou will be saved. That's you today. You want to be saved. Just trust Jesus. Confess with your sins and just ask him to come into your life. If you want to make your confession of faith today, publicly, we invite you to come down. Now, as we lift this to us here in the United States, all around the world, maybe you're listening to us this morning behind prison bars. Maybe you're in a desperate situation. Whatever the case may be, today, you can come to Jesus just as you are. Don't let your past hinder you. Don't let what people say about you hinder you. Just know that Jesus suffered and bled and died for your sin. Whatever it is, whatever it is, his blood covers it all. That's you today, and you listen to us by way of technology. We invite you to connect with other Christians, a Bible believing church, where you can go in your faith. Amen. Who's going to tell them? Yes. Jesus Christ give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.